Hi friends, great job planning everything. With your map and sketches in hand, it's time to dive into Unity and bring your level and VR environment to life. Before building with final assets, you want to quickly prototype the space to test the feel and pacing. Things to look out for while testing are, how long does it take to get from point A to B, emotional changes, and simply how the different moments you've strung together feel. We can make this quick prototype by gray boxing or creating a block out of the level or what I often say, gray boxing the environment. It's called gray boxing because the default material is matte gray for primitive objects in Unity. And yes, I've seen primitives appear with a white material like in the standard pipeline. We can even go deeper with the why here. In software engineering, the terms black boxing and white boxing are used, and I believe gray boxing falls somewhere between those ideas. In game dev, we say gray boxing when referring to the prototyping of level designs. A link to one of my favorite websites about this is in the description. We'll use Unity's primitive objects to lay out what we've sketched on paper now in 3D. Later, these primitive shapes will be replaced by final assets. It's important to start testing with your headset as soon as possible, not just to check the feel of the space, but also your primary mechanics and gameplay. Doing this also prevents you from getting used to placeholder art or spending too much time on artwork that you might replace anyway if the mechanics or feel are off. Creating a separate scene to test mechanics might also be good as to not mess up any of the environment setup. For me, I like to test both the environment, feel, and gameplay at the same time, so I usually leave these together. Using a separate scene is what I often use to isolate errors, and that's super helpful. Before we continue, I want to mention that there is a lot of enthusiasm amongst my XR peers to use Shapes XR. I've played around with it and don't use this in my process because I like to get to work right away in Unity, but it might be something you'd like to try. It seems to be great for mixed reality or team collaboration. I'm also interested in checking out Bezel, but haven't yet. I'll let you know. Now let's continue with my preferred process and show you how I gray box. In a previous video, I talked about how I prototyped this scene in a weekend. However, we want to gray box and gray box from the sketch that we created. So let's start there. Here's the sketch that I made for the same scene and it's a top down view. Here's where the cars are on the outside and a sidewalk. And then you go down an alley and then enter the club. Here's the player. And then I put numbers by things that they encounter and interact with along their user journey. So let's go into an empty scene in Unity and gray box this. Okay, I'm gonna stop there for sake of time, but I just wanted to show you how you could quickly create a scene using primitives. You could see that this club is a little claustrophobic and I would probably need to make it a little bit bigger. These are the guests. Here's like the DJ booth and the bar, but yeah, it, it, that's a little bit small. So I would make it bigger. And of course, this is something that you would test in your headset. And that's why you gray box first so that you don't waste a lot of time putting the final assets in and getting really particular. And then you realize you did something like this and made it like way too small. So this is a quick example of that. 
if you see in the hierarchy here, a lot of objects are starting to show. And as you add things, this list is just gonna get longer and longer. So what I like to do is I right click and then I create an empty game object and I start putting similar items together under that parent. So walls is a good one. And I'll take all the walls from this club and I will make them children of this parent object. And I'll do the same thing for guests. And let's drag all of the guests into that area. And as we do that, we clean up the hierarchy and it, it's a lot easier to, to go through. A good example of that is in the shadow men scene here where I have the entire exterior under a parent object. And I even have lighting under a parent object as well as audio and visual effects. This is really good to keep organized in your scene. Let's go back to this scene for a minute. I did not put the cars in a under a parent object. And the reason for that is I think in this case, you might want to make prefabs out of the cars. And then after you make a prefab out of the cars, you might want to spawn them so that they are driving randomly back and forth along this this uh this roadway here. And in that case, you could delete these out of the scene and do it that way. Another thing I'd like to show you when it comes to prefabs is this example. I've got some doors here, but they are just the frames. So imagine that this is an entire house. And when we first are gray boxing this, we just want to see, you know, how it feels to go maybe from one room to the other. And we just don't want to worry about the doors. So in this prefab, it does have, if we open this up, a door, but I've hidden it. And the reason why I've hidden the door by unchecking it in the prefab is because I just wanted it completely open so you could just see the, you know, how it felt and how it looked as you walked through the entire area. But let's say you're done with that and you're really happy with the flow and you want to put the door back. So you go into this prefab, which is where we're at right now. Check that so you see the door again. Go back to the scene and all the doors are there. So I just wanted to show you how you could quickly put things into your scene by using the prefab. Now, another example I would like to show is when I worked at Pika, this is one of the first drafts or like a semi gray box before I started putting all of the final items into the scene. There are some final items here like these mine carts and the track. However, I didn't wanna go too crazy just in case the team had any changes. And I also wanted to see the scale of a waterfall, which is this greenish blue rectangle here. I was using the terrain in a previous draft, the terrain object that Unity provides, because I wanted to see if I was going to use that for the cave where there's a lot of stalagmites and stalactites. But I decided against this because I thought, well, that might be too high of poly. And then if we take a look, this is what the almost final scene looked like. We did have to take these vines out because that was just way too many polys. I was trying to really push the system in that case, but I realized, oh yeah, that's way too many polys. And then one thing when I was in this scene over here, you may have seen me clicking on a wall and then right clicking and using duplicate. But another thing that you can do is you can press control D on a PC or command D on a Mac and duplicate an object quickly that way. When placing interactable objects or interactables around your scene, they should be easy to grab. Sometimes they appear closer in VR than they actually are. This often requires making a collider's range larger. 
In part three, I mentioned planning in real life physical space. Another thing you may want to try is placing post-it notes around a real space in your home or office to denote and determine spatial relations, in particular for something like reach. This will help you get an idea of how far something is to pick up. If it feels awkward in real life, then it also will be awkward in VR. If you're done gray boxing and testing in the headset and everything looks and feels good, it might be time to replace those placeholder assets. When doing so, I just wanna mention a reminder about scale. In my scale video, I talked about how to maintain the one 3D unit, which equals one meter from Blender to Unity. Both programs default to this measurement, and I suggest creating or scaling your assets at their true size, so you don't have to scale them down later. Otherwise, you're going to have to eyeball and guess which will take too long. If you're mixing and matching 3D models, whether your own, free, or paid ones, be sure to check scale and set everything to their true size. In Unity, go to a model's import settings and make any scaling adjustments. Remember to bring them all in at one. Once your prototype is ready, get another set of eyes on it. Find testers that preferably aren't your friends to give you honest feedback. Gamers can be brutally honest, will always find a way to break your game or try to go to the edge of your world. Getting their unfiltered opinions will be helpful, but don't take anything to heart. It's also important to know how to decipher feedback, which is probably for another video. If you've been following along with this series and have gone through all the steps with me, I congratulate you. You've laid down some serious groundwork for your game and now can share this progress with others for feedback or find people to join your team. Whether or not you enjoy the design process, I hope you have a better understanding about how important it is to have a designer on your team. In future videos, I'd be happy to go into more depth on anything from this series. Level and environment design are some of my favorite aspects of VR game design. So let me know in the comments what you'd like to learn next. Thanks for watching and happy building.